All right, today, as you can probably guess by looking at this, we're going to be talking about fourth, the programming language, which I'm sure some of you have at least some familiarity with, but probably not everybody. Um, fourth is a stack-based language. And what that means is that it actually uses the idea of a stack, which is always there in every programming language you use, and makes that sort of the, that is the method by which you actually pass parameters and do all of your work. Uh, normal pro programming languages, they always use a, use a stack internally, so whenever you call a method or call a function, current application state is pushed on, or the current scope of whatever function you're in is pushed onto a stack, uh, the new function runs, and when it's returned, your, your old state is popped back off. So there's always a stack at, in, at play, but uh, fourth actually makes it sort of explicit. And the way this works is that, uh, for instance, functions don't actually have explicit parameters. All functions take things off of the stack, and when they're done, they put something back on the stack typically. Um, and each function then has to have, usually has a sort of a comment, which is a description of what it's going to do. So when you look at a function definition, you can see, okay, this thing's going to take two values off the stack and give me one value back. Uh, fourth is not, uh, it's not type checked in any way at all. So if you just do things wrong, you'll get, you'll get runtime errors. Um, so there's, there's nothing in, in, there's no kind of type safety at all. Um, and it's also imperative, which means you can actually just in, an, in a sort of interpretive mode, you can just type things into a fourth environment and, and make things happen. Um, but that being said, it's also compiled. So if, you have, if you're running a, a fourth program and you load up some file of source code, it does actually compile things on the fly as it loads it up. There may be a way you can make, make it sort of pre-compiled and, and save things out, I'm not quite sure. I think that depends on implementations. Uh, fourth has a lot of uses actually in embedded programming in where you have very limited resources and small amounts of RAM and uh, limited CPUs. Um, NASA has used fourth extensively for many, many years. So a lot of spacecraft are flying around with their, all their instructions uh, done using fourth. It has, it has a very small runtime footprint and it's still, though, a very powerful language. Um, so it is what is called a concatenative programming language, which essentially means that, uh, like I said, the functions don't take parameters explicitly. So for instance, um, in a normal language, we might have this sort of sequence of things where you're going to produce a result w based on calling three other functions. In a language like fourth or in any other concatenative language, you typically wouldn't see any of these parameters being passed around. You would put the first parameter on the stack, and then you would just sort of call these three functions all in a row, and the result of the last one is going to be what is still on the stack. The, uh, there are many implementations of fourth. One of the ones that's easiest to use is gfourth, because it's available for everything. Um, I thought I would uh, go through a few little examples of some things. Um, I'm not going to do an extensive, like, deep dive into everything about fourth, but just some of the basics. So, uh, the basic unit of definable things is the word. So, fourth doesn't have any concepts of structures or functions, or it has sort of functions. They're they're designed around words. Um, there are no objects. There are no classes. There are no methods. There's just, they're just words, and anything that is. Uh, separated by white space is words. So if I type uh, one, oops, one space, two space, or actually press enter, one and two are each essentially words that the this interpreter turns into integers and actually just puts them on the stack. So if you just type anything that can be defined or that the system knows is sort of a constant value, typically a number, it will just put it on the stack. I can at any time look at what's on the stack without affecting it by typing dot s. This shows me the whole stack. It shows me that first in these angle brackets there are two things on the stack and it shows me what there are. There's it's a one and a two. And, we, and the one that it, as far as to the right is what we say is the topmost item on the stack. Um, we can pop one item off the stack by just typing a dot that shows us one the, what is the top item and also changes the stack. It takes the top, top thing off. So I type dot s now. We're down to just one thing on the stack. It's just that one. And I can do the same thing again. If I do it one more time, it'll give me some failure, saying it should be saying that we're at the, the top of the stack, but it actually gives me a, this cryptic error, address alignment exception. I do not know why. Um, uh, one thing I wanted to mention is uh, Booleans are crazy. So true is there and false is there. 
And if you look at these, true is defined as minus one and false is zero, which is totally not what anyone ever would expect. But the reason for this is that um, these are actually sort of, uh, if you think of things, these as bit masks, so false is actually defined as um, all zeros. I think that was not, not how you do it. No, I forget how to do it. Maybe that is. No, that's not showing me anything. There's a way you could figure out how to. There's a way you can actually get the hex value of something. So a false is all zeros, and a, a a true is all ones. And if you have any sort of signed integer value that is all ones, that is in two's complement arithmetic. That's a minus one. So. So that's why true, which is a, a, a you know a series of bits that are all ones, ends up always showing as minus one. Um, now the the way that you can do the, the way that you do operations on things is you, you type in the name of a word, which is an operator, and it will pull things off the stack and use them. And this means that essentially you have sort of a built-in reverse Polish notation calculator at all times. So if I want to add one and five, I can do one five plus. And the result, I'm not seeing right now, I have to pop it off, 6. And if I want to do 47 times 23, then I get that result. And so all the, and so if, if I take these things a step at a time, like say I just do 1 and look what's on the stack. I have a 1. Oops, actually, wait, do you want to increase the font size? Uh, sure. It might not be able to. That's probably a good idea. Um, over here. So, okay, now I have nothing on the stack. So if I take things one at a time, I put a one in the stack, it looks like this. I put a five in the stack, it looks like that. And then if I do a plus, I look at the stack again. So the plus takes the one and five off of the stack and leaves a six on there. Does it take the only the two last elements or only, any other elements? Only the last two. So plus is defined as taking exactly two things. So right now, if I try and call plus when I have only one thing on the stack, it'll give me an, an error saying it's, again, it's a cryptic error. It should be telling me uh, there are not enough things on the stack for what you want me to do, but it doesn't. Um, uh, let's see, so there are a bunch of common stack operations which I have uh, listed here, drop, dupe, over, swap, brought, nip, and tuck. And these are all things that they, they work with the, the top two or three things on the stack and change the order of things or duplicate things. So for instance, if I have on the stack, if I put one, two, three on there and I type dupe and look at what I have now, that just duplicates the top item in the stack. Or if I, uh, let me pop that off there. So now I have just one, two, three again. If I type over, that takes the item that is one below the top and copies that and puts it on the top. So it's sort of like, duping the value that is one level deeper. And there are a bunch, of, I'm not gonna have to go through all these, but these are all pretty much standard. There's, there's more or less kind of a standard library of what's defined as being uh, standard fourth, and these things are all in there. Um, and then there are some things like uh, two swap and two drop and two over that will work with two values at a time. And the reason for this is that, um, especially more in the old days when you might be using a 16-bit or an 8-bit CPU, and the the numbers you were dealing with might just be like an 8-bit value, but you need to do, be able to do 16-bit addressing, 16-bit math or whatever. It's very handy to sort of say, okay, I want to duplicate a value, but the value is not just a single a single integer, it's represented by two integers that are two spots down. So that's why you have these things like two swap and two drop and two over. Um, let's look at a bit more here. Um, so there are, you can have rest of line comments that start with a, a backslash or delimited comments that start with a parentheses and with parentheses. And all these have to have white space around them because each of these is sort of a word. If we want to define our own word, um, there's a standard way of doing it. You, there, you start with a colon and uh, give it a name. I'm gonna get, I'll make something called my word. And normally what you do in your source code is you want people who are looking at this to be able to understand what does this thing take off the stack and what does it put back on the stack. So let's, uh, actually let's make, let's make a, a silly word called add that takes two numbers. And so inside of a comment here, I'm going to say, it's going to take two numbers, dash, dash, and it's going to leave one number on the stack. Space. Oh, yeah, right, actually, actually that, does, that doesn't matter. That's the one case. So 
write parentheses as the end of a comment does not need to have a space in front of it. So once you once you start making a comment, it will it will scan everything up until a write a write parentheses. Um, so here I can say, okay, I've got I, this this word I'm, I'm defining is going to take two numbers, and so I have to assume here that there are two numbers in the stack, which means I can just write plus, and that will that will add two numbers together, leave the result in the stack, and I end my definition with a semicolon. Okay, so now I can say 23.5 add, and look at the result immediately, and I see this. So my function definition worked. Um, and again, this is well, if we if we have nothing on the stack, if I actually just uh, empty this thing, um, then if I try and type add here, I'll get the same kind of thing as if I would with anything else. It'll say it's address line ex exception. It doesn't know what this is. or And it, sh it shows me a backtrace. You can sort of see what's going on. It's saying the plus couldn't do something. Um, you can also define locals, uh, local variables inside of a, of a word. So here I've got a sort of shortcut here for a swap. Um, that, you can do that using curly braces. You can actually use curly braces inside anywhere inside of any definition. But if you do them at the top, then you can actually skip this uh, stack effect comment. So we're going to say this thing is going to take an A and a B and return a B and an A. And we'll actually define that by saying, okay, we've got an A and a B that, we, that, we are, that are being pulled off the stack and put into these local variables. We want to leave on the stack the reverse order, so we just type B, A, and a semicolon end it. So now if I say 789 swap dot dot, we get them back in the reverse order. That is, it pulls off the seven first, because that's, that's the top now. Does the definition, so it's not typed, so you can, the definition can be anything. It could be A, B, A, B if you want to define it that way, as long as you return B, A, right? Uh, yes. Yes, I think when you do this, I think what comes after that dash dash is not really also, this is important. A, is that a comment? No, it's not a comment. It's a... That's defining local local uh, variables, basically, uh, right. that, that it will pull off of the stack for you. Um, there is some flow control, so you can do, and it's kind of strange, because again, everything is sort of reverse Polish notation in a way. Let's say we want to define an absolute function that will take the whatever values on the stack and give us the positive version of it. And so we'll say this thing returns some number and it's going to return a positive version of that number. So what we do here is we say, okay, we've got a number on the stack. We want to look at it and see if it's, if it's more or less than zero. But we, don't, but we still want to have the number around. So let's, we'll duplicate the number so we, we make a new copy of it on top of the stack. And they're going to put a zero on the stack, and we're going to compare these things. So we want to say if the number that we just copied is less than zero, if that is the case, then we're going to uh, call negate, which is a built-in word that just inverses, it takes the thing off the stack, gives you the, the negative of it, and then end if. So now if I put a number on here, uh, let me see on the stack, we've got 234, and if I type abs, then we've got 234. If I put another number, like something else, minus something here, ah, I can type a negative number, minus something, and type abs, and look at the stack again, and we get the positive version of that. Um, you can also do, there's also an else version shown over here. I'm not going to go into it because I'm already running out of time anyway. Um, uh, you can do loops um, with this, these begin and end structures. So basically, the, here is a function called endless. I can just copy and paste this. Um, if I, so endless it starts with a zero, and it will duplicate that zero, add one to it, and uh, then it will just co go back to this begin again. And each time it's going to call a dot also to print out the current result. So if I run this, it's just going to run and run and run and run. So, oh, and it's interesting. All those are coming out as hex, as hex values because I typed hex earlier. I think if I type decimal and do this again, it will go back. Yeah, that's how that, that's what that does. Um, you can also break out of a loop using a thing called while. So uh, also defining this here. I've got a, oops, I've got a little function that takes a number and gives you the sum of all the integer values up until that number. Um, so like if I type for sum and look at the result, look at that. 
And so what it does, it also loops with this begin and end repeat, or uses repeat instead of again. And inside of there, there is a while. What this does is it looks at the the last value of what was compared and see if this is true or false. And depending on if it's true or false, it will either jump back to the beginning or it'll either continue where, where it was from or jump back to the, uh, jump past the repeat line. So it's all sort of, there's nothing super complex, but it's all kind of a different, it's all a different order from how we're used to things, things appearing in, in, in the code usually. Um, I wanted to point out a few more resources about this. Uh, there's a, a book called Starting Forth. This is available online and also in print. This is, I'm pretty sure, the first thing that I ever saw Forth in uh, like 20 years ago. I remember checking out a book from the library that I think was this one. Um, and uh, it has a lot of examples and shows sort of the how you can sort of learn this step by step. Um, there's a ton of stuff you can do with Forth. Here's an implementation of object orientation in Forth. Ta-da! Don't ask me how it works, but the the language is powerful enough that you can actually do a whole lot of things. So this works by sort of defining some structure of how some things should work, and you can make you can make classes with inheritance and all kinds of things. Um, here define here's showing an example of how you can make a class called button and have let it have some attributes, and you can do things with that button later on. Um, another thing I want to mention is there is a a thing called Factor, which is a modern uh, environment built around fourth concepts, and it works pretty similarly. But it gives you a nicer sort of um, it gives you some some help about about doing things. So we can do the same kind of things we saw before, and it shows us the stack. And if we just add things onto the stack, it shows us the stack every time we do anything. So it's it's kind of like a a little friendlier interpretive environment. And if we type something that isn't a word, it'll say, "Hey, that's actually not a word. What do you want to do about that?" We can just hit escape and go on and do something else with it. So it's a bit more of a friendly environment than just the bare command line. Um, and of course, all these things are very you know cross-platform. G fourth and uh, Factor run on every everything, and they're all source you know open source and everything. So it's there's quite a lot you can do, and uh, you know it's maybe not that useful for a lot of what we're doing, but I think it, it's it's very interesting because it gives you an interesting sort of look at. Once you start, once you understand how this works, it makes you understand how a lot of the other programming languages that we do use actually work underneath the hood. That these things, this, thinking about this stack makes you think about how everything else that we do is actually implemented, even though we don't usually see the stack too much. Um, that's all I've really had for now. Any questions? Anything? What do you use it? What, what do you like? What, what is it used for? Like, What's it still used, or it is, it, what was it used for in the past? It is still used. Um, it's used for a lot of embedded systems okay. where you where you want to run a very simple thing that maybe doesn't even have an operating system. They're just like this dealing with some inputs and outputs. So again, like a lot of spacecraft and satellites are controlled using using Forth. Okay. All all this stuff written in Forth, where you have you have a very constrained environment because <coughs> this thing has a very small memory footprint and a very very small runtime resource usage. So it's it's a very it's a very efficient language once it's compiled. And like lots of firmware is written in forth mm. and some bootloaders. Yeah, that too. It's like like a BIOS could be written in forth oh, right. kind of thing. So it's very similar to the, the C API of Lua. Mm. Uh, so it's it's basically the same concept. You just push stuff onto a stack and then you call functions which uh, in turn uh, pops stuff off and pushes other things to yep. And all the function definitions, or like the, the documentation where the functions in, in the Lua uh, documentation has annotations for like, pushes these many elements, pops these many mm. elements, right. might throw errors or not. Right. <laughs> yeah, so it's very simple. Cool. All right, good. Thanks. Thanks. Thanks.